Welcome, welcome, welcome. How's everybody doing? Hope you are doing well. My name is Andrew Kuhn with Focus Compounding, on air live with Jeff Gannon. Jeff, how's it going today? It's going very well, Andrew. How's it going with you? It's going great. We hope it's going great with everybody else as well. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out all of our content that we push out into the investing universe. Uh, best way to do that is to follow me on Twitter at, at Focus Compound. Uh, and if you want to get access to everything uh, uh, blog related that we've pushed out since 2005, uh, go to focuscompound.com uh, to get access to that for free. And of course, if you want to learn more about our money management services, uh, both through the managed accounts or our fund, uh, you could go to focuscompound.com, click that invest with us tab, and you'll learn more about that. Uh, you could reach out to me at Andrew at focuscompound.com uh, to start that process and go down that path. So happy new year, Jeff. It is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's actually the 28th of uh, December, but we, you know, we pre-record. So happy new year, Jeff. Happy new yeah. year to everybody uh, that's mm -hmm. listening. And what better way uh, to have the first podcast of 2024 than to create a game plan for people, Jeff, of okay. how they can uh, look back at the end of the year and just be super proud that they were disciplined and they stuck to this uh, and they became better investors throughout the year. And we're going to talk about how to invest when you only have an hour a day to do it. So we've spoken about this in the past before. We've written, you've written a blog post on it before, uh, but you had said that somebody reached out to you recently mm -hmm. about this topic. So we wanted to revisit it. What better time to do it than the first podcast of 2024? And just as a backdrop, you know, this is what we do all day long, right? This is our profession. Perhaps the vast majority or half or whatever of the people listening do not have that luxury and they only have an hour a day uh, to focus on investing. And there are even some people listening that say, I don't have an hour a day. Um, I think the reality is you do, right? Munger talked about selling yourself an hour a day uh, in the beginning of the day. Everyone, maybe your sleep schedule is different or what, maybe it's easier to stay up an hour later. Um, but it's this idea of focus and having um, the discipline to spend that hour focused entirely on investing. So before we jump into that, you had said somebody reached out to you about it. Uh, so I just wanted to, you know, uh, get your thoughts on it. Obviously, it's on your mind because you you spoke to somebody recently about it. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to cue that up, Jeff, and then let's go through, you know, how to invest when you only have an hour a day. I uh, uh, I summarized an old blog post of that we could go okay. over. Um, but yeah, just wanted to hear your thoughts on that generally, and then we'll dive into it. Yeah, I agree with you that, you know, you could figure out a way to to find an hour a day. Um, and I think that we can go over the stuff from the old blog post to get an idea of that. But yeah, even if people feel that they don't have an hour a day, you can usually get it, especially when you add up all the time that you spend passively reading stuff related to investing things, right? Yeah. Um, including listening to this podcast. Yeah, including listening to this podcast. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And you know, the problem is too, right? In 2024, um, I don't even know what you want to call it. I mean, our monkey brains, right? Scrolling through Twitter. Mm -hmm. I don't have TikTok, but I've seen... Have you ever watched somebody on TikTok, Jeff? Yes. It's I've, like, yeah, I've been to airports and stuff. That's all that people do. Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. I mean, like, oh my gosh, you know, absolutely crazy. I mean, I will, uh, you know, confess uh, that I have gone on. Is it YouTube shorts or youtube reel I, I don't know one of those youtube has mm -hmm. their own version of it right and there's times where i'll just be like laying in bed on youtube and, and looking at you know the shorts or whatever and i'm just like holy cow like i have to almost like force myself just like put it away it's like i'm like pulling myself out of this 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 dark hole of just i don't even know right and the problem is too it's like it starts feeding me everything that i've watched recently on youtube I don't watch TV. Uh, obviously, I subscribe to like Netflix and Hulu and whatnot, but I do watch a lot of mm -hmm. YouTube. I just, I just do. And you know, I'll be watching somebody building a log cabin in the wilderness, and all of a sudden, I go down my shorts or reels or whatever it is, and it's just like all these 
reels or shorts or of like that topic. So I just, I get sucked in. So it's crazy. You have to pull yourself out of it. Uh, but yes, to your point, you do have an hour a day. Everybody listening has an hour a day. No excuses, right? You go in the morning, you do it on your lunch, you do it on your way home. You, uh, like you listen to an audiobook or, or something investment related, you could queue up even articles that you found online. Um, but, uh, or you do it late at night, but the point of this is the focus. So maybe you should not do this while you're driving. Um, but so if you have access to the Gannon compilation, which you could find that out on the internet, why, where I compiled everything, um, you can read Jeff's old blog post on it, how to invest when you only have an hour a day to do it. You could type that in on Google and you will find that article, uh, where Jeff gives a framework of exactly what he would do if he had an hour a day only to focus on investing. And we could go through it right here. So I just uh, copy and pasted the main points, but you should definitely go and read the article. You said, I'm going to ask you to spend five to seven hours a week on investing, but it must be an hour a day, every day, instead of five hours all at once, okay? There's a reason for this. I want you 100% focused when you are working on investing. You don't have to spend a lot of time on investing, but you do need to be focused when you are doing it. Most people who invest are never fully focused for even an hour on a narrowly defined task. So that is what I need from you, an hour a day of total focus. So can you commit to that for 2024? One hour a day. If you can't do it every day, then don't do it at all on weekends. Just spend an hour a day on Monday through Friday, but never skip a day. Okay? So we've committed to that, right? So the approach that you want somebody to follow, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is a focused mm -hmm. approach. You say a concentrated approach. You don't have a lot of time. So you need to spend that time focused on what matters most. Stock selection is what matters most. So you're taking this idea of like thinking about selling, thinking about different strategies, all this stuff out of the equation, right? right? It's a concentrated yeah. approach. Uh, yeah, and, I'm not saying you, you can't do that, but if you only have an hour a day, get rid of all of that stuff and just focus on picking stocks, not mm -hmm. any of the other decisions about weighting portfolio, all that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You said, first, I want you to give up the idea of selling stocks. Don't worry about it. You're only going to sell one stock to buy another stock. You're not going to sell a stock because it is now too expensive. The situation has played out, et cetera. Okay. So we've cut out about half the time investors think about stocks. You can now devote all the time you would have spent thinking about selling the stock you already own and instead double the time you will spend thinking of the next stock to buy. And why is that? Is that something that you consciously do or is that more so just from a time perspective of only having an hour a day? Yeah, it's time. It's what is going to give you the best payoff, which is to gather information other people don't have and to act on that. Um, it doesn't mean that things won't change and that you would be better off selling something, but you're not going to have the ability to spend hours every week monitoring the state of the economy and things like that. So yeah, if you bought Carmart when you thought it was a great stock in a more benign environment for things, and then it gets out of control, you might be in a stock that you shouldn't be in anymore or a bank stock or an insurance stock or whatever, right? It could change over the cycle. But if you don't have that much time, what you've got to just focus on is finding a great company. Uh, finding a great bank, a great insurer, a great whatever, and not worrying about where we are in the cycle. Um, fund managers and stuff can do that. But if you only have an hour a day, that's not for you. Mm -hmm. So you say, so I'm going to ask you to commit to identically sized positions. By this, I mean the positions will be the same size when you buy them. So if you are comfortable being as concentrated as I am, then you'll want to set 20% as your position size. You'll own just five stocks. If you want to be more diversified, you could settle on owning 10 stocks at a time. That's fine, but I don't want you to have some 5% positions and some 20% positions. If you're going to own 10 stocks at a time, make every position a 10% position. If you want to be really, really diversified, you can own 20 stocks at one time. In that case, every time you buy a stock, you put 5% of your portfolio into the stock. There's no point owning more than 20 stocks. It doesn't do much to diversify any risks. And it does distract you from what matters most, deciding which stock to buy next. Okay, so let's go over that. Why do you want them equally same size every time that 
they're going to put it on and again is it just to take out the thought of anything that does not have to deal with buying a security or a stock yeah because you're going to be stressed in terms of how much time you have to make decisions and so what can turn out happening is that a lot of your results good or bad will be a result of the position sizing that you did and you're going to do that pretty arbitrarily if you don't have a lot of time to spend on it thinking about it so you're just going to size something at 20 percent and something at two percent and you actually spent similar amounts of time on them and you know i don't want people to be under um time constraints and everything when making those decisions and those could have a huge amount of determining your results they certainly do with someone like you know buffett or something a lot of it is how he size things um and so if you realistically aren't devoting a ton of time to this then that's one thing to get rid of um you know and, and again fund managers and stuff can have more than 20 stocks they can monitor them and everything but for someone who only has an hour a day who's selecting stocks all the time that's just, just way too much i mean what we're talking about is you know if we're doing only weekdays then we're talking about only you know a, a little over 250 hours uh a year um obviously that's not a lot of time for each stock that you'd be worrying about um mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so you continued the next thing you need to do if you only have an hour a day to spend on investing is to commit to holding stocks for as long as possible this is critical i want you to try to get closer to the five-year holding period why the ideal situation in terms of focused attention is a five stock portfolio and a five-year holding period that's because this is a low maintenance portfolio. The maintenance level of idea replenishment is just one great idea per year. We have an hour a day to spend on investing. If you spend that every day, including weekends, that means you have 365 hours to spend picking just one stock. Coming up with one good idea for every 365 hours you spend looking for one sounds easy, right? Even if you don't work on investing on the weekends, it'll still be 260 hours of thought to come up with just one idea fair enough right so you basically you're you're trying your hit mar uh, your hit rate is one idea per year and all the time that goes into that yeah the idea is this way you can reject as many things as possible so you want a really high percentage of saying no a really low acceptance rate and you know the way to do that is by having a um very few ideas relative to the amount of time that you have People can have 20 times more ideas than you have, but then they should spend 20 hours more, you know, 20 times as many hours on it and stuff, which, mm -hmm. you know, is, is not out of the question, actually, for there are probably um, managers of funds and stuff who've worked 100 hour um, weeks and stuff. So <laughs> it's happened. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not unreasonable to think that, you know, that's why the difference is they can do 10, 20 times as much stuff because they're spending so much time on it. Mm -hmm. So people listening could be thinking, what if this is a new portfolio? Am I just trying to invest in one stock this year and have it built out over five years? Mm -hmm. How would you try to work that? Yeah. If you're starting a portfolio from fresh. Yeah, or from definitely. Uh, like the beginning. Okay. Yeah, definitely. We've talked about this before. Look, it depends on the risk that you take versus the outcome that you're looking for. But for instance, if you're listening to this and you're 19 years old and you haven't saved any money, um, you don't. You can put 100% of your net worth in one stock. It's fine you're it's ir not very relevant versus the amount of savings you expect to have in the future if you're 60 some years old and you have lots of savings and things then yes only take a small portion of that and put it into a new stock this year keep most of it in the same stuff that you were in before it's a huge part of it and you'd be taking a huge risk to devote much of your portfolio to that but you putting say four percent of your portfolio into something at 60 something may be very similar to the same level of risk that someone at 19 would be taking because you may be in a situation where you don't realistically think you have a lot of years of being able to save money in the future and you have a lot of net worth relative to your future savings. Um, whereas the reverse could be happening if you're very young or something like that. Um, you know, so I, I would always get away from the thinking about it as a static portfolio. That's not realistic for most people. Most people save over time and stuff. They don't inherit some portfolio on their 18th birthday and never save again. Because mm -hmm. remember, we are talking about individuals, not PM, central managers, whatever. Totally um, different for them. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what kind of stock should you spend this 365 hours a year looking for? And where can you find these ideas? You say you want great businesses that are having temporary problems. You want a list of companies you might one day own. 
Where can you come up with such a list? Guru Focus has a Buffett Munger newsletter. It has a mm -hmm. Buffett Munger screen and it shows 15 years of financial data for stocks. I actually think that's a really good screen from Guru Focus. I mean, I, I, mm -hmm. I believe they still have it, but if you do look at like the predictability, I mean, it's like five stars for most of those companies. I think that's what actually, you would know more about that, but I think that's one of the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, pre-qualifiers or whatever to be on that list and then other things like that. But those are very Munger-esque type of companies, high, very high quality businesses that you could follow and like keep a list of uh, tracking, you know, to see if they ever sell off or have temporary problems or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when I did things for that site, um, I picked them not based on price or anything. I just would write up whatever companies I thought were the safest for the really long term. The idea being if someone reads a report on something, the price could change a lot in the future. But the company, if it's a really predictable company, is less likely to. So it's worth your time more. Um, mm -hmm. it, a cheap, really cheap stocks might be worth your time a lot. But if you don't have a lot of time to spend, the problem is that if those prices move around a lot, it's not going to be as interesting. Whereas if you mm -hmm. have a really high quality company, Meta might not be interesting to learn about this year, but last year it was, you know, at a low price, maybe at a low price again one day. Um, whereas, you know, a stock like Alico or whatever that we talk about might be great for people with more time to look at, but that might not be the best stock for people who have very little time to look at mm -hmm. because it's only really going to be of great interest when it's pretty um cheaply priced and stuff it's it's not as durable an idea it doesn't pay off as much that you can keep going back to it no building on the, your knowledge of the business and things like that the industry mm -hmm. yeah no well said look for the predictable ones you can use ratings on this look yourself at predictability as you would judge it not just as a computer program would do you see a dependable history of eps stability eps growth margins returns on capital etc i look at ebit Margin volatility, that's always my favorite measure. In my experience, most companies, by which I mean most managers who run the day-to-day -day business of each unit, location, etc., don't want to do less physical volume this year than last year, and they don't want to have a thinner profit margin. They like doing a little more physical volume, unit volume, than last year, and they like making a little more profit per dollar of sales than they did last year. They are frightened by the idea of falling volume and falling margins. So... The competitive pressure in a lot of industries is toward protecting volume and protecting margin. When volume declines, a company may try to lower prices, increase marketing, etc. When margins decline, a company may try to cut overhead, look for synergies, cheapen the product, etc. We often don't have good unit volume data. Um, and then you go on like that. Uh, he's talking a little bit more about it. But basically, you're talking about trying to find very predictable businesses and you give mm -hmm. a way to find that, right? So the the volatility in the EBIT margin and stuff like that. A lot of people, and we've spoken on the podcast too, how you could just, we do it all the time on like quick advice. You could just like eyeball it, right? Yeah. And see also if there is uh, a lot of volatility and, and whatnot in that metric. Yeah. Look for things like Costco, not things like um, Friedman Industries. You know, look for things like Meta, not things like U.S. Steel. Um, mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that the other ones I named aren't the better stocks, but they're going to be too hard for someone who doesn't have a lot of time to spend to think about them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say EBIT margin is just pretext operating profit divided by sales. The level of the EBIT isn't what's important to me. In a business like software, you could have an EBIT margin of 30%. In a business like groceries, you could have an EBIT margin of 3%. That's really the same thing. So stability in the EBIT margin has to be defined as variation scaled to the mean. Yeah. Again, people can figure this out for themselves, but I get this question. It's one of the most common questions we get all the time is how do I know that this, you know, business is stable and predictable and everything? How do I know this other one isn't? You can just do something like Guru Focus, which uses a computer to figure out predictably things for you. They're using something a little different. It has much, much, much the same thing. They are basically drawing a line and then seeing how the fit is along that line, you know? And um, that's very similar. It's the same sort of thing. Like I did something similar with that with the Schiller PE. Um, it's mm -hmm. exactly the same sort of thing. So I did it with a method that's different than what Schiller used. The, it's going to come out the same way. It's just a bunch of different ways of saying, let's smooth something over 10, 15, whatever years. You can do it with your eyeballs or anything else that way. Um, but this is a question I get all the time because people always want mathematical rules for how to do this stuff. Mm -hmm. You say, I prefer industries where EBIT margin variation defined as the standard deviation and the 15-year EBIT margin divided by the 15-year mean EBIT margin is low. 
And I like those companies in an industry who had the lowest EBIT margin variation. So it's interesting, you're talking about industries now, mm -hmm. right? You're looking for very predictable industries. And there's also a lot of other things behind industries where the EBIT margin variation uh, is very low, right? You're really talking about industries that aren't as competitive, probably settled industries. They're not going to, you know, um, it's not like an AI industry where it's very competitive. There's a bunch of upstarts and everything like that. This is a very settled, a very good way to find settled industries, right? Yeah, it's like when I talked about uh, electric cars. The problem isn't that the demand for electric cars is going to change a lot. It's supply. Too much supply is going to come on. And so inventories will go up too much in a year. And so prices will fall and stuff. Whereas with gasoline cars, supply and demand is going to be more stable because people, the producers aren't trying to change the level of supply that much. Industries with fairly stable supply and demand um, work that way. The, the reason for this, it might not be obvious. If you lose the leadership position, then you would be exposed to these risks. So it's much safer to be in an industry that's also very predictable than to be a leader in an industry that's not very predictable, but you're the leader. That's a risk for something like Costco. If Costco loses its relative position in the industry, then it's badly exposed to certain risks in a way that um, certain other companies are not that are more similar to the mean anyway. So that is a problem that you have if you're the low cost leader in something. It tends to be a really bad fall when the when the model falls apart. So, you know, if you're Southwest Airlines or something and it all falls apart, you're going to look like other airlines. Um, so that's the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you talk about building a list of companies to follow, right, with this. And you say these companies may not be good investments yet, but they are good takeover targets for the bigger companies in the same industry. Um, let's see. You speak about uh, following the right people. Uh, through blogs. Uh, at the time, uh, uh, The Science of Hitting is someone that you had recommended. John Huber was someone that you recommended. Yeah. Uh, following Valley Investors Club, Corner Berkshire. You don't actually uh, say that, but you do You know, browse that site as well. Um, and you said, if you're going to read them, don't read them willy-nilly, right? Block out your article and blog reading times. So don't read one article of mine at a time or The Science of Hitting article of or base hit investing uh, article like all at once. So what you're saying is basically print them out, uh, put them in a basket or have an hour a day where you basically read all of them at once, not just like kind of be casually doing it while also casually checking email while also casually checking Twitter. Um, yeah. Yeah. And only do this to the extent that you need to define new ideas so that you have a list of 10 Ks to read. Um, I strongly recommend doing as little of this as possible. Um, it's only so that you can fill your inbox. You said, this is what you do. I have baskets that I fill with reading material throughout the week. Then I tell my Amazon Echo to set a timer for one hour and I read as much of the material as I can get through. I put the rest aside till later and do this again. I read with mm -hmm. a pen in my hand and mark up the articles, posts, etc. I read with questions of my own. This ensures I am 100% focused and 100% engaged with the material. I've seen this uh, for myself in person. Uh, asking, uh, is it Alexa to set a timer for one hour right mm -hmm. and usually for a lot of people i think if if you can get an hour into something you'll keep doing it but the problem is is getting them started especially with like a 10k with something that might be dry reading for people at first yeah yeah this is what i use right here i got one of these but you literally set it and then it'll start just timing and boom i don't want to do it through my phone i don't have an alexa or whatever <laughs> so i just have this little thing that sits here on my desk and when I do blocked, uh, you know, uh, hours or whatever of focus, I always just set that and I just try to really uh, dive in. So that's what I use. Okay, let's see. Um, so you conclude this article by saying an hour a day is plenty to spend on investing, but you have to spend it 100% focused. And as a recap, um, or you said your suggestion for someone who only has an hour a day to spend on investing. Number one, read deep work, rules for focused success in a distracted world. I mean, that book's probably even more relevant now than when it first came out because things have only just you know gotten crazier. Uh, two, spend all your investing time focused entirely on selecting which stocks to buy. So again, you take out all of these other things um, mm -hmm. that get you away from what really matters, which is what is the next stock to buy, the only time you're going to sell 
uh, position is when you have something else to buy because you need that capital. Um, three, read articles from authors like The Science of Hitting and John Huber, but only in an hour-long focus batch of reading material. Four, use tools like Google Focus's predictability ratings and 15 years of financial data to find the most predictable businesses. You could also use QuickFS, of course. Five, mm -hmm. buy great businesses that are going through temporary problems. So, yeah. Why? I guess a lot of people always want to also think about like, how do you define a temporary problem? Right? Mm -hmm. Like, what is a temporary problem versus a value trap? Well, so a temporary problem is usually not a structural issue that undermines the business permanently or the industry. So um, an example would be like, um, uh, you know, the, the, the most famous example would be Geico, which with Buffett, which took uh, policy decisions on it, its own that inflicted damage to itself. And if it changed that, it would um, still have intact its, its moat and all of that, right? Um, it is more questionable if Bud Light or something, if that was a individually traded stock, right, is a temporary problem. Um, so we talked about that with movie theaters. COVID, is that a temporary problem? It's a temporary problem for a while, but eventually it becomes a permanent problem. That was similar to where Buffett said, you know, with, with Kay Graham, a strike is a temporary problem, but I'll tell you when the strike goes on too long that you'll lose the business and that they won't come back to you. If COVID had gone on long enough, if studios had never put movies back in theaters and stuff, then it would have been obviously a permanent problem um, when it changes the, the way that the industry works. So it can become a permanent problem, um, but you have to judge that for yourself. And media reports are really bad for that. You know, they confuse those things. So everything is always a permanent problem. Um, you know, everything is always, once things are going in a certain direction, they're going to keep going in that direction forever. Um, and that would be, you know, like we said, um, now there are temporary problems that if you survive, um, you can go on and they were temporary, but if you don't survive them, then they're not temporary. And that's caused by having like lots of leverage, usually things like that. Um, you know, and Buffett tends not to invest in those kinds of businesses and those will be harder for people. So like Haynes brands, is it a temporary problem? Is it a permanent problem? To some extent, it may not matter if they have enough debt and enough problems with generating cash flow, they could be at risk anyway. But if Buffett owns Fruit of the Loom and they have the same problems, but don't have any leverage, then they get to find out if it's a temporary problem or a permanent one for the owners, you know? Mm -hmm. Has anything changed or would you add or subtract anything uh, since you uh, wrote this article, which I believe you wrote it in 2016, I believe. Yep, 2016. Has anything changed from your perspective? Yes, I would probably remove the um, stuff about reading other people's writings and stuff. Um, and I might even remove the screener things. Uh, that would make it hard because then how do you find ideas if you're completely cut off from everything? But I think that I overestimated how people could be in touch with those sorts of things, read those sorts of things, and yet still do the deep work of this going back and forth, task switching between those. I think that that might be more dangerous than I thought um, at the time, even though I say, you know, gather it all together at once, do it once a week, whatever. But I think having people in search mode for a new idea maybe is a little too dangerous. Um in terms of distracting them from what they need to be doing, which is basically you need to be spending an hour a day reading 10 Ks. That's what you really mm -hmm. need to be doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What about, so, I mean, from like a maintenance perspective, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, standard maintenance, quarterly calls, reading the annual report, I mean, not quarterly calls, but make quarterly reports. Maybe you do read transcripts, right? You read a lot of transcripts, uh, reading mm -hmm. the annual report when it comes out. Um, is that basically what you would, you know, put towards us. I know this is more targeted to someone that doesn't have a lot of time. Um, but I guess, you know, how do you kind of avoid thesis creep or in this scenario for this individual, you know, keep up with things to decide if you made a mistake or didn't make a mistake or anything like that? If you have an hour a day, I'm not sure that you have time for that or that you should spend it on that. 
Buffett hasn't reviewed a lot of his big winners. Venture capital stuff doesn't do a lot of monitoring of their stuff. What they really make the money off of is just not even price and stuff, but that they did commit fairly early on that they were involved early enough in the process. So I think, you know, realistically, that's something that you would end up spending a huge amount of time on and that's not going to pay off much. I looked at that myself with things I've sold versus things uh, I didn't sell. And, you know, if you pick the right stock in the beginning, it's hard to have a sell decision that makes sense, that pays off. Um, now, if people are in other kinds of business, other kinds of stocks than we are, much more growth stocks that can really go wild, then it could happen. You know, the stock price could get out of control and you could have a real problem. Um, you know, we mentioned that with the Magnificent Seven stocks. I mentioned that with FICO. FICO is a crazily overvalued stock. And it's a great company and it would have made sense for someone to buy it maybe five years ago, certainly 10 years ago. But now, yeah, you got to just live with the fact that something might drop and stay down 50% or more and never recover from that if you own that kind of stock. But, you know, Buffett had that kind of experience in Coke and, you know, it's not ideal. Look, it's not optimal. But if you only have an hour a day, I don't think that monitoring it is a great way of to use your time. I think finding new stock ideas. And then when you have a stock that you like better, using that to bump off the stock that you own, that you like least is the answer. But I don't think that trying to just sell without having the new idea ready, um, I don't think that's something you can do if you're, if you don't have spending, if you're not spending professional type levels of time on it. Mm-hmm. Got it. Cool. Well, I want to thank everybody so much for tuning in with the both of us on the Focus Compounding Podcast. I really recommend reading this article. Uh, you could, again, type the title in, but I will also put it in the description. And it is on our website, focuscompounding.com. Uh, so be sure to check all of that out. Uh, if you're interested in learning about our money management services, you can reach out to me at Andrew at Focused uh, Be sure to hit the subscribe button wherever you are listening or watching us here today. And we will see you in the next podcast. Take care.